So welcome back to the management case study. Now it's time to start with the chapter two onwards and to see how we can pass the management case study exam easily. Now firstly, let's introduce to the uh, SIMA MCS exam firstly in the chapter number two there. Of course, this exam, as you may know, three hours. So this means that it will be 180 minutes in total. But please do remember that in the actual exam, you need to score at least 80 marks for that. But how 80 marks are calculated is none of your business, it's the SIMAS business. Okay, now what you need to do is to follow the exam technique very closely. So the exam itself, as you can see, that you will need to, for example, 45 minutes for a question, or we can call it as a task. Because that will be 180 minutes in total. So this means that it will be four questions, usually in the MCX exam. And of course, there will be five variants, okay, for the exam itself. So, making sure that you're ready. Now, each of the questions would usually to be split into the uh, section A, or we can call it the task A, uh, or the section B, section C, and something like that. And nowadays, of course, the exam link will give you specific mark allocation for that. So, if I will use the first A, I will need to take 45 minutes and to times by 60%. And that'll be the uh, duration for uh, this question requirements that I, I need to spend time on. Now, another bit that you may be aware of is that this is a case study exam. It's the written paper, unlike what you have covered in the objective test papers. So this means that all the bits and pieces there, when we are marking the script, of course I'm not the SEMA uh, marker at the moment, but uh, I mark a lot of mock exams for SEMA uh, papers, but I'm the marker for the ACCA and also the ICAS in Scotland. So when we are marking the script, the, the marker will be impressed by the first impression of the candidate script. So making sure that later on I will show you what would be a good answer, what would be a bad answer. So avoiding those bad answers will be absolutely key there. So therefore, my conclusion for that for the first part is that always plan your answer before you write something down. So how are we going to be planning the answer? If I were you, that 45 minutes, yes, I would be spending 5 minutes at least, or 5 to 10 minutes, to read the exhibit or the exam day, and then open the pre c material by clicking on the button on the screen, and also clicking on the scratch part, okay, on screen as well. When we are reading the information, try your best to link the answer to the pre c as well as the unseen information on the scratch part, and then copy that and paste them into your answer box, which means the word processor, at the same time, making sure that uh, you should plan the answer, especially how many points they're going to be writing. So, for example, for the 45-minute task, I would highly recommend my student to write approximately 10 paragraphs. And, of course, 10 to 12 will be absolutely fine there. But don't just to uh, override the answer in one single question. Because you have to make sure that uh, you will improve the quality of your answer. So that's very, very important there. So, of course, I've, I'll summarise all of these bits and pieces. You can read them on your own, okay, into one, two, three, four, five bullet points and so on. But very important is that if I were you, I will only spend approximately 35 minutes up to 40 minutes to finish one particular task or question in the exam. I will need to devote some time into planning. Now, planning for what? Of course, as you can see there, 
SIMA has published the guidelines for the level 1 to 3 answers and of course I've applied these to the complete flat tool. Now let's see then, if the question requirement asks you to discuss the challenges and potential opportunities that the flat tool company may be facing, now let's see a level 1 answer. Not many marks for that and sometimes no marks. So for example, the level 1 answer says, OK, we've got a very complex environment, therefore using PES or SWOT analysis may help. Now, why I'm saying that this will be a level 1 answer is simply because you're simply repeating the requirement. There's no point in doing that. There's no point in writing any intros, which means the introduction, into your answer script. At the same time, you have not detailed the model at all. For example, you say PESO analysis. So what each of the letters stands for and applied to the case. Now, what if we've made some sort of application to the case? So let's see the level two answer. Now, firstly, we've talked about the political. Seeing the answer, stability and government support in the target market is important. OK, political uh, volatility can impact investment security and operational planning. OK, you're bringing the implications there. However, it's not detailed enough because when seeing this point, we're not particularly sure what fact or complete is going to do. So level three answer, as you can say, for a political part, Engaging with the local authorities can reduce such risks. So you're bringing one step further. That one step further can include, for example, the reasons behind it, further risks for it, or the recommendations that you recommend that you provide to the management. So making sure that each of your paragraph to make sure that you're not writing too many points, but for a political part, okay, bringing, so for example, what, why, and how, okay, into one single paragraph will certainly help to improve the quality. Now, this exam, I would say, is the mark uh, awarded to students will be very, very generous indeed. And as you can see that in the MCS, the exam questions are not technical at all. Of course, some of the questions may be involving the accounting treatment and that kind of stuff. If you don't know about anything like that, of course, you're highly unlikely that you can score any marks for that. However, for the subjective parts, for example, okay, show me the challenges, show me the risks and so on, there'll be no correct answers at all. So this means that whether or not you can get marks will really depend on whether or not you're making sensible points not make it too silly point. At the same time, try your best to link your answer to a case and showing one step further. So for such subjective part, you can certainly score marks. Now, that's all I can say to you. Of course, with regards to professional marks, you can read them on your own. I would say that in this paper, always link your answer with a prezi and to focus on the unseen material, on the exam date, and then demonstrate to the examiner that you've got one step further in your answer, avoiding any intro, avoiding any repetition from the requirement. That will be very, very key for your exam success there. Moving on then, let's see the chapter three, which is the core activity area number A. You need to demonstrate to the seamers examining team that such I can questions that you can answer them regarding the capital investment appraisal, regarding the digital data sources, pricing strategies, business models, and then disruptive and digital operating business models and the WAG. Of course, I've summarised all of these bits and pieces into five sections in the chapter three onwards. Now let's see the section one though. Now, the capital appraisal technique here I've summarised into a very holistic approach. Now, it's important to understand what do I mean by capital investment is where 
we're going to be buying the property plant equipment or the PEPA. Of course, in this PBSA industry, we may be buying a lot of site. Of course, it's up to the portfolio management team members in that department to be responsible for it. And of course, you can read the framework on your own because you've studied that, of course, from the SIMA P2, taken from the SIMA P2 syllabus, understand the objective and review the processes and, uh, and to assess the criteria according to MPV, IRR and so on and so forth. So these will be quite basic stuff. Now, what I would do is that I will also take you through to the exam rehearsal questions from 1.4. Because here, I'm showing you how this topic actually came up in the past. So, for example, the exam question may say, explain the challenges in determining the MPV for the project. And of course, when we are talking about the challenges regarding the MPV, three particular factors are uncertain. Number of years into the future, relevant cash flows forecasts, and the appropriate discount rate. So all these bits and pieces will be uncertain. So there will be a lot of problems in estimating all of these three in one go. So what you need to do then is to detail all these three, each of, it, each of them in turn in your answer, linking back to the case and, and most importantly, linking back to the unseen information from the exhibit on the exam day. That will be very important though. Now, the potential examinable areas to the flat tour company, I would say that maybe we're looking for a new PBSA complex. Maybe we need to renovate the existing properties. Maybe we're going to be acquiring the competitors. And of course, in the SIMA P2 syllabus, you also need to know about the digital transformation. So this means that with regards to the IT part, we need to change that thoroughly. So for example, we may be implementing the integrated property management system and the app and so on. Of course, all these bits and pieces would require the flat tool company to spend the money out, which means to invest in these capital projects. So you need to watch out. Moving on to section two, we're going to be considering the digital data sources. Now, what that means is we will need to understand that where does the data come from? From the digital accounting systems, from the management information systems, and how we're going to be collecting data, for example, using the Excel, or perhaps understanding it from the business intelligence system, so for example, using the Microsoft Power BI system and to view these sort of data, and even using the big data software that within there, we've got the data mining analysis technique to show me the trend, to show me the interrelationship among these data. You need to know the basic idea behind it. And of course, how this section may be tested have been tested, I would say, in the past. So for example, that the examining team, yes, because I visited SEMA office in 2019 in London, I uh, had a meeting with Steve, which means uh, Stephen Flatman, and uh, he told me that, uh, I mean, at that particular moment in time, because the introduction of such new issue that coming into the syllabus, I asked uh, Mr. Steve, a question how this topic may be tested because uh, if you were to be tested about the Microsoft BI in the real life you need to know about the operation of that however when it comes to the similar exam very general questions that said by Mr. Steve that will be tested okay so such as for example in the past that the potential advantages the business uh, intelligence system would bring uh, to managing performance across the company. So what you need to do is uh, what sort of advantages, which means how it works. For example, it integrates data, providing real-time information, helping us to predict what's going on. So try your best, okay, try your best to mind map any sort of ideas related to this section and linking back to the uh, factor case, it will certainly help. Okay, now 
all sorts of things, yes, you can read them on your bike. Very, very straightforward indeed. Now, regarding the flat tools company's case, of course, the top priority may be the customer relationship management systems that we may be considering, or perhaps by considering the social media analysis platforms, it, for example, irrespective of the data coming from these platforms and how we may be analysing those as well. We now move on to section three about pricing strategies from a SIMA P2. Okay, you need to answer how to set up prices for flat tour company. Of course, from the SIMA P2 syllabus point of view, very basic stuff. So for example, the PET, the price elasticity of demand. So which means that if it is less than one, it is inelastic. If it is inelastic, of course, it's highly likely that you can increase your selling price so you expect a small drop in the demand and overall revenue will be maximized or will be increased. So you need to know about that. Of course, from my perspective though, yes, in this industry, that if you are going to college, of course, the pet will certainly be lower than one. So irrespective of charging $10 or more, Perhaps it makes no difference. It, it makes no differences at all uh, to the tenant or to the students because the students still have to pay for it. So um, this is the idea. Uh, you need to understand that. However, in the actual exam, there's no point in saying to the examining team that yes, I know pet price elasticity of demand. I throw the term to the examining team without explaining explaining it at all, no, this is not the way that we can score high marks in the MCS exam. We need to keep that very straightforward. So for example, if you're saying that a pet is lower than one, I will interpret this as the following. In order to attract more tenant to choose our business, we'll need to differentiate ourselves from our competitors in terms of the branding in terms of innovating our business, so for example, considering the sustainability and so on, because I'm effectively saying to the examining team that I know PET, what PET stands for, which means the tenant will choose our company even though we put up our prices. So how are we going to be doing about it? Of course, to differentiate yourself from our other competitors, for example, in terms of bonding, in terms of other technology issues, so you can attract more tenant to choose your business, for example. So using these simple illustrations, avoiding the complicated jargons, for example, the pet and something like that, that would scare many uh, people on the planet, of course, that will score you more marks in the paper. Of course, as you can see, there would be a lot more pricing strategies that you have already covered in your previous studies. Now, from my perspective though, it's important that you understand the market-based pricing strategies for the flat tool company. What do I mean by market is what I mean by customers or people. Now, you need to have certain strategies or tricks in place in setting up the selling price so you can allow more people, more customers to choose your business. So for example, why not to introduce the premium pricing options to charge a higher price okay, for the, uh, for the service option with uh, a lot of other services that you can provide. If you're introducing the first service or the first new product into the market to consider whether or not you're going to be setting up a high price, which means using the skimming approach or the penetration pricing, which means the uh, lower pricing option there. Alternatively, to differentiate yourself from your competitors, uh, or perhaps using a loss leader, so for example, you can check out, yeah, live here uh, for one week free of charge, and after that, I will charge you a higher fee. But during that one week, I'll receive nothing from you, I'll receive very low rent from you in order to attract a uh, potential tenant to use our service in order that we can lock them into the future. Providing discounts, okay, if you book more rooms and something like that. Perhaps control pricing, 
uh, to, yes, all about the government, not about our company at all, or perhaps we bundle other services to sell to the customer. So all these sort of ideas, you need to be able to understand them. So all of these ideas, for each of the pricing options, not only need to consider the PET, which means the price elasticity of demand, whether or not the customer will be happy in buying your services, but at the same time, you will need to consider the costs of each of your options in place, so that's very important there. Now, how this topic may have been tested in the past. So, for example, yes, from 2020, discussing factors when setting up the price and recommending with reasons the strategies to adopt. Of course, there'll be no correct answer for that, from my perspective, but you have to make sure that each of the point that will be well explained. Well explained point, remember, level three answer. Always showing one step further and that will score you the maximum marks in the exam there. So for example, considering the cost, demand, elasticity and so on. Of course, in my pre sim recording, I'm also showing you about the market structure of this business. According to my analysis, of course, the market structure would be monopolistic competition. So this means that always to think about to differentiate yourself from other competitors will be very key for you to achieve success in this industry. Now, of course, yes, I've shown you all these factors to consider and always be the list, okay, into your mind when you're applying these in the future exams. Right, okay, now moving on to section four in this chapter, coming from the E2 syllabus, another I can questions, okay, introduced by Sima. It's all about the business models. So what do I mean by business model is how you're gonna be competing with your competitors. Just to recap from the business ecosystems and their participants from the SIMA E2 syllabus. So the best ways to think about this is to think about the Wikimedia and the YouTube. So for example, uh, from a Google's point of view, because YouTube uh, is one of the product line from Google, and YouTube allowing a lot of influencers to post their videos or making posts uh, onto a YouTube channel and can be, re can be viewed, it can be viewed by many other users and the users can be coming customers or even the suppliers and so on and so forth. So as you can see that nowadays when we are talking about business, it's not about simply to compete with our competitors at all. We, sometimes we may be working with the competitors maybe working with the competitors. Uh, so for example, I just to give you an example, in my note, that the business ecosystem for the flat tour company, that we maybe collaborate on the industry-wide challenges or standard, and that will certainly benefit the PBSA sectors as a whole in terms of the taxes that we may be charged in terms of the standard regarding the health and safety in order to make sure that, yes, we can differentiate ourselves from others um, to stop other small competitors coming into, the, coming into this market if they are not fulfilling the health and safety standard and making sure the prices are not too low and so on. So you need to have a say in this market, for example. Now, the idea will be quite new. Instead of simply competing with your competitors, work with other stakeholders, including university, local government, tech providers, and other real estate partners, and so on and so forth. Because we need to view the business as the ecosystem, all the participants within there will be very dynamic. Today, he or she will be a customer, but tomorrow, he or she may become the bank, may become the fund provider, may become our shareholders, and so on. So we are connecting with each other more closely and there will be a wide range of participants because they may be changing all the time. Today will be a customer, tomorrow will be the supplier. Therefore, we always think about the value co-creation. 
So that's very important, though. So, for example, uh, in the previous analysis, I told you about the referral program that we can always think about that. Yes, this would be a same because uh, the student, yes, becoming our customer, but at the same time becoming our partner to create more value by referring our services to their fellow student. So adaptation will be very important there to make sure that you grasp the trend and to make sure that you utilize all of your competitive advantages to increase your value. Now, of course, the 4.2 about the elements of the business models, this has been in the pre scene that I've analyzed for you already. You can read them on your own, how to define value and so on and so forth. Now, it's also very important from the 4.6 in my note about the strategies to build disruptive business models. Now, there will be different strategies in there. So, for example, building uh, these models from scratch. Okay. Alternatively, you buy somebody in the market or becoming a partner, for example, under a joint venture agreement to share the risks and the rewards and so on and so forth. There would be different digital operating models, for example, the cloud-first model to be applied to a flat tool company. So, for example, the cloud-first model, we are linking all these bits and pieces, yes, in the cloud software. Alternatively, data-centric models. So, for example, making sure that we utilize advanced data analysis to identify the tenants' behaviors, what they like, Agile model, on the other hand, especially when we are talking about the amenities, okay, it's the extra services that we provide to the tenant, so we need to be quite adaptable, okay, to the new services that the customer may find it very useful. So, for example, some of the tenants or a lot of students, so for example, in China, they prefer that we are not giving them, let's say, three dollars, but want us to pay for the services that they subscribed. For example, the music company like Google, okay, in, in China, for example. So we give them a subscription service, and effectively we are paying three dollars to that student. But it makes no difference at all, okay, in, from a company's point of view. However, if we were to, uh, I mean, uh, to advertising it. Like, we're not giving you $3, but we are giving you that service. Okay, the students, yes, would value that a lot. So, being agile, which means being very flexible in terms of introducing the services that the customers really like, will be very important in our modern business environment now. Yes, customer-centric about the mobile app and the platform model where all these providers can interact with each other, and, and, and even like the Facebook, okay, so or, or, or the WhatsApp group, and they can interact with each other. So these are sort of digital operating models that uh, may be popping up on the exam day, but we're not particularly sure that. Of course, there would be digital disruption as well. So how can we survive, okay? So for example, an example on the exam day may be saying that uh, a competitor has emerged in the market and the digital platform they introduced, okay, no one else has such platforms in the market so far. So our revenue, yes, uh, currently our revenue is the highest one. So uh, in the market, so what too, if our market share is stolen by that competitor, how can we survive? Of course, you need to use a holistic approach to answer this question. So, for example, we need to have the inspirational leadership, which means that we need to have the CEO or the top management team in place in making sure that they place great emphasis and, uh, and care very much on that. Okay, so when we are thinking about the subsequent implementations. And also we need to think about the competitive edge, okay, to, to, to continuously analyze the competitors digital strategies to identify what sort of gaps and opportunities that we can exploit and establishing a very clear strategic direction okay and to influence 
external parties like the customers gaming feedback, collaborating with a lot more stakeholders and so on and so forth. You can read them on your own. The past exam questions how this section was tested. So for example, identify and explain the impact of providing online products on the business model. Now, this question, I would say, again, has no correct answer at all. The reason is, if we introduce the online product, of course, our resources may be diverted in the online sales, for example. The revenue stream may change. The cost structure may change because we don't need to rent the physical offices any longer. We may be reaching a lot more customers and so on. Now, it's not about the points that you're making that will certainly score your marks, no. It's all about how you describe each point in your answer. If you're simply saying that, okay, introducing the online sales of other services, okay, on our, on our website, so uh, what would be the impact on our business model? Number one, it will affect the revenue, full stop. And then number two, it will change the cost. I'm sorry to tell you that you're making the correct point, but you're not explaining them in full or well enough to score you any marks. So if I'm the marker, of course, I will give you no marks at all for such comment. But if you're saying one step further, it will change our revenue structure because currently we are relying on this service, but introducing that, we are running a risk that di diverting our resources, okay, so it may be not particularly okay to sustain our existing businesses and that would be quite risky as well because we've got no experience of doing that at all. If you're saying this into your paragraph, congratulations, yes, you will score the full marks for this point. So making sure that you always be okay with how we answer this type of questions in the MCS exam. Now, before we move on, to the section five, I'd like to tell you a bit more about the stuff like this. Now, um, because I marked other professional accountancy bodies, their exam, the actual exam script, I've been an examiner, of course, in the financial management module in the past. Now, um, I know exactly how the marking actually works. Now, for example, um, if I'm saying that I want you to explain why this is important or why this is vital. Now, a student script may be saying that, so for example, talking about the pen, pen is important, it's vital because it helps us to write. Some students may be further adding a few points. So, for example, if we can write that uh, we can uh, submit our papers, for example, to school, and then because we can submit our papers, and therefore uh, the school can mark it for me, mark it for me, and then uh, perhaps I can be a top student. If I become a top student, the school will benefit and the society will benefit as well. Now, it seems that you are explaining one step further, but I will tell you exactly that these type of answers will score you no marks at all. Okay. Uh, the reason why this will be a case is because you're saying that the pen is vital because it helps us write. And then you're saying that the implications of writing is important because we can submit our papers. Uh, and then you are saying the implications of submitting our papers will be important because the scoring can mark and they can become a top student. And then you're saying the implication of a top student that uh, school benefit and society will benefit as well because we uh, because of this pen. You may be finding it very funny. Yes, it's quite funny. I would 
also tell you that a lot of students in the past submitted this type of answers in their script. So for example, I'm asking students to identify the political challenges that uh, our flat talk company may be facing. Yes, the students may be saying that the regulation may change. The regulation change is important because uh, we need to follow the regulations. If you don't follow the regulations, the uh, planet as a whole will be a chaos and so on and so forth. You're not saying, you're not explaining from a perspective of a flat tall company. You explain like uh, from a government's point of view, from a planet's point of view. There's no point in doing that. So therefore, a very useful my, uh, the framework in your mindset to be using is that, so for example, I'm explaining the political challenges. Okay, so uh, what it is, political challenge, specifically about the regulation about the health and safety. The regulation about the health and safety, h &S in short. So why this is important, but from the flat tools point of view, this is important because if you are not uh, following the health and safety regulations, that the flat tool company will be fined. Now, I will also explain one step further. You can say that the implications for that, you can bring from the pre scene that we focus on quality and reputation would be the key. So, uh, if you are not following the health and safety regulations, this will be against our mission, for example. And what to do? You can also say, that how to do it. So, for example, uh, we should constantly manage our risks by assessing the risks about the regulation more frequently or having the dedicated team to look after this issue. Now, if you're using this framework, not from the previous example, saying that pain is vital so that society will benefit, stop these type of answers, but use the framework such as this, you score very high marks in terms of the narrative part. Now, the final section in the core activity number A there is the weighted average cost of capital from your SIMA F2 syllabus. Now, when we are financing our business, we can sell debt, which means we can borrow money, or we can sell shares to the shareholders, which means we issue shares. And of course, when computing the cost of debt, will be the interest expense can save us tax. And therefore, we times by 1 minus the tax rate from the KD, which means the yield, which means the interest. However, when we are computing what would be a cost of issuing shares, we call it as a cost of equity, or KE. Now, of course, when calculating a cost of equity, there will be two models that we can use, either based on the dividend, or we can call it as the dividend valuation model. So it means that, for example, shareholders will need to spend $10 in buying the share. However, when the shareholder buys shares, we need to pay them dividend worth of one. So this means that the cost to the business, they give me 10, I give them one, one over 10 will be 10 percent there. So that will be from a dividend valuation model's point of view. Alternatively, some companies may not pay a very high dividend, so they will need to incorporate risks into computing the cost of equity for the company using capital asset pricing model, or we can call it as the CAPM model. The CAPM model would deem that investors are holding well-diversified portfolios which means that one company's risks may be offset by another company's one. So therefore, the only risk they will be suffering would just to be the systematic risk, which means like the inflation, that kind of stuff, from a market as a whole, rather than the unsystematic risks related to the each of the individual companies. So making sure they understand to talk about these in the exam. Of course, the cost of debt, on the other hand, will really depend on whether or not the debt will be non-traded, which means taking a bank loan from the bank, or the traded debt, K 
can be negotiable, which means transferred in the open market. So talking about the traded debt, it can either be not paying you back the initial investments that you input in buying the bond, and that will be irredeemable. Alternatively, using internal rate of return to calculate the effective return for the redeemable debt. However, in the actual exam, that this topic will not be tested usually in numerical terms. But you need to understand that how can we calculate the weighted average cost of capital. So let's say that we use 60% of debt finance and 40% of equity finance, and the cost of which for debt finance is like 7%, and the equity finance is like 8%. Now, the WAC will simply be 60 and 40% related to debt and equity, and times by the costs and plots all together. And that will give me the weighted average cost of capital. But also make sure they understand that when we are calculating a weighted average cost of capital, it's like the, the cost of capital to the business, which can be used as the discount rate for the investment project. That's a very, very important idea. They always bear that in mind. But when should we use the WAC to become a discount rate is where the new business, the business risk of a new business and the financial risk would not change. So not changing the business is well as the financial risk Okay, of a new project. So which means that if you are the flat tool company may be doing a new project, however the new project is still in the same industry, which means the PD, uh, PBSA industry, if that's the case then business risk did not change. At the same time we are doing a new project, we don't need to increase the level of debt to fund that project. So if that's the case then the financial risk did not change. So if that's the case then, yes, you can use WAC to calculate the uh, net present value of a new project. So that's all you need to know. Right there, so so far that we finished off the core activity number eight from chapter three. I look forward to seeing you in the chapter four. I'm going to be recapping the ICAN questions, okay, in a similar syllabus. I look forward to seeing you then. Bye-bye. PC accounting for your future